day. So, so, well, yeah, yeah. Everyone <laughs> <laughs> to say something? Yeah, yeah, we'll go, like, go. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Right behind me, eh? Hey? The dirt. The English soil. I'm very glad to be here. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, it says. I'm saying it's ours. It was Jared Winstanley who said that the earth is a treasury for all. And here at the Royal Exchange, they think this has been one of the concentration points where the fullness of the earth has been brought into the hands and transmutation of gold. And this has happened by means of blood. So you look at the pictures, and they are just the, the uh, bar relief of the Royal Exchange. This goes back to the 1690s. And then behind me is the place of gold. This also goes back to the 1690s. Our present crisis now, we can go back to the 1690s to see how the earth and the fullness thereof was transmuted into gold and to a small handful of people who have expro expropriated from around the planets the fullness of our labors from Africa, Asia, South America into this spot. So I won't say I'm glad to be here, but I'm glad to be with you. And Ian Bold over here won a wonderful project of class war that reverberated around the world. He showed me his wonderful memoir not long ago. Do you have any copies, Ian? No, not that cheap. I read it, I read it across the Atlantic and I laughed all the way. Beautiful. So I'm looking for a good laugh today. The 1690s and then the other bubbles, I have one or two historical things to say. Relating them to terror. Because the financialization crisis now and the war on terror are inseparable. This is what we need to understand and figure out. And Fig is here is going to lead us step by step with the architecture of all this. Now, one other thing before handing it over to Fabian that I'd like to mention. It's the surveillance state. And me and Chris and our fellow workers over with the camera were having a chat and we were a bit suspicious of one another. But soon he wanted to know what we were, I wanted to know what he was. Well, he's just reporting on the inflation rate that's coming out of this building sometime today. That's it. So he said, yeah, oh, is it tomorrow? Anyway. It's the Bank of England report. Oh, it did, did it? Oh, the state. All right. That's on the state of the earth and the fullness thereof. <laughs> All right. So, um, may I turn it over then to Fabian? Hi. Well, thanks, Pete, for that. That, that was. <laughs> wow, that was quite something. Hiya. Oh, yeah. Reject to the back of the theatre, darling. Right. <laughs> I was just thanking Peter for his contribution. Because I must admit, I find it very enlivening and very enheartening. And um, I know we've been standing around here for a while, so what I'm going to suggest is we start off on the walk and we'll pause for different chats on the way. But I think the first place we need to go is actually, we need to go inside the Royal Exchange because I don't know, some of you might have a bit spare money you want to spend on some of the expensive jewellery there or whatever. But to actually see it inside, and it actually gives you some idea of how the rich live. It's also uh, worth pointing out, as Peter mentioned, that it's built on blood. And what do we have between us and the Royal Exchange? But a war memorial for the blood that's been spilt in the interest of British imperialism. set up by 
by Thomas Gresham. The information it says out there is actually wrong. They say it was based on the Bourse at Antwerp. Uh, it's actually based on the, on the, sorry, it says there it's based on the Bourse at Amsterdam. It was actually based on the Bourse at Antwerp. It was actually based on the Bourse at Antwerp. However, um, Antwerp had de declared independence from Spain and after an army arrived, the, all the trading houses from Antwerp moved to Amsterdam. But um, Thomas Gresham, he was actually involved in trading on the bourse in Antwerp, uh, selling a lot of wool, and he wanted to shift the trade over to London. He set this up, he had Queen Elizabeth come along, she said, wow, this is amazing, and gave it her royal blessing. So um, from that stage it became the Royal Exchange, and um, the proceeds from the Royal Exchange went to found Gresham College, which was the, uh, there was no university in London at that stage, so that was the first educational establishment in London. So it, 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 this setting up the Royal Exchange funded that. So now we're going to go on through there and um, continue our exploration. Can I just say something else about this place? <coughs> um, Sorry, can I just interrupt before you carry on? You're actually blocking the um, fire exit. Can you stand up there so everyone can hear you? <laughs> if there's a fire, we'll flee through the fire exit. Yeah, but also unlocked. Not, yeah, people are actually videoing here. You're not allowed to video or take pictures. It's all to do with security of the building. We don't allow it. We don't allow photography. Please don't take pictures. <laughs> I'm afraid unless you've got turn. a big police force, you're, you're not going to give us a quick sound. No, no picture, look. Just, just tell us how we're banned, what's more for the cameras, how we're banned from doing what we're doing. No, you're not banned, we just don't allow don't photography. <laughs> photography. <laughs> <laughs> and also, of the shots and the things. If you're making a joke, you may leave. Because you're actually, you're actually blocking people's businesses. I'm sorry, you're talking to a bunch of anti-capitalists, they're not going to pay an awful lot of attention to that. Have you got something to say or what? Yeah. To say? Um, yeah. On the 10th, yeah. on this year's Black Friday, on the 10th of October, uh, that was the day when the London stock market fell by, I think, 7%. And all the freebie papers had nothing but the, uh, the fall of the stock markets around the world. There was um, a demonstration that met up just outside the front of here called March on the City. Um, and then about 10, 15 metres away, just out, outside of the Royal Exchange in that direction, the City of the London Police deployed police dogs. And that's the first time that I've, in 30 years, I've had dogs set on me um, while trying to video the, the process of a uh, demonstration. And there's another fellow that I know, John, who had his camera ripped out of his hands by one of these police dogs. Uh, myself and other people have got it on video, um, and that's likely to make its way onto the internet before too long. Um, one of the other report video reporters there, Jason, did a quick um, edit, uh, including that footage that was shown at Real News in the foundry last Sunday night, and a, a more comprehensive multi-camera edit is likely to be shown at the Real News screening on Sunday the 14th of December also at the Foundry and to get uh, information on these dates check the Intermedia London events listing where you'll find this event that kind of screening and lots of other events. Yeah, I think it is. Now, um, when I came here, before setting out, I, d I just really felt I needed that, uh, a nice cup of coffee. Sorry, sorry, you can speak up. Use yeah, the coffee mug as an inhaler, <laughs> seriously. Take the bottom out, it'll work. <laughs> Let's try it. Um, yeah, before setting out, I thought I really could do a nice cup of coffee before I came out. 
And when you look at this sign here, you'll see I'm not the first person. <laughs> I am, for the people who can't read, it says, on this site between 1680 and 1778 stood Jonathan's Coffee House, the principal meeting place of the city stockbrokers. Now, one of the things about coffee is that they also like to have a lot of sugar in it. And a lot of people still, even today, like to have a lot of sugar in it. And coffee, coffee drinking, tea drinking, all became part of this urban lifestyle with lots and lots of sugar. And this was completely tied up with the slave trade and slavery and sugar plantations and everything like that. So the coffee was the actual commodities that people started to drink in Europe were linked in with the uh, world domination, which Peter was talking about just, just now. And um, so the coffee houses were one of the principal places where, where people would meet and get together and in this instance, you know, do all their business. There were other coffee houses which were a bit more radical in nature, but um, the radicals tended to drink a little bit more beer than <laughs> coffee. <laughs> So I think it's probably something that's still true to this day. Anyway, let's continue on through there and down to the right. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, to make a point, thanks to the sugar and the coffee, both addictive, both transatlantic, both the commodities of money, both the commodities of exchange, both from the earth, but we didn't see the blood, really, did we? We didn't see the labor of it. What we saw is traffic. And this is what disturbs them. We had the plate glass windows. The plate glass window to entice and excite us had not yet been developed. The business was done in the coffee house, which as we know, because we live in such an era, the coffee is the drug of money, it, it, unlike alcohol where you will lose it quickly, but the <laughs> drug you can calculate and the sugar can up you. These are the drugs that begin in the 1690s and that go with the gold, go with the calculation. This is why they were so upset in the Royal Exchange, because they were afraid the traffic would be interrupted. Traffic is for buying and selling only. If we stop to talk or read a plaque, it immediately causes suspicion of the interruption between the commodity and money. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. I hope this is a bit better. <laughs> Can you hear me at the back? Right, um, scattered throughout the city of London is a whole range of churches. Um, okay. Scattered around London, the city of London, there are a large number of churches. This is the, St. the parish church of St. Mary Walnut. And in fact, for the number of people living in the area, which is very small, there are an awful lot of churches. Um, one of the things is that actually the City of London is a very religious institution. And um, alongside making all this money, they have these livery companies. And the livery companies link up with the churches. and, and the, so the livery companies and the churches provided another area for all the businessmen to meet. But when I say businessmen, it's because the idea of business women is really something introduced only in the last few years, right? Basically in my lifetime, the, you know, the, some women have started to move in these circles. Before that, it was just straightforward, um, a male environment, and the livery companies were should we say they were a lot of them had their masonic lodges in, but they were, had all the features of um, public school, um, male environment, and the churches and everything like that. And and so in many ways, the kind of Christianity that evolved out of this 
reflected that social origin and um, basically in a line with the Anglican Church with the Queen at the top of it. And so this was a whole hierarchical structure which was the basis of the religion which then reflected how the people who, who created all of this wanted the whole of society to be. So we're going to go across the road and down that road just there. I, I just wanted to say, as a tourist, the, uh, the monument there to the fire of London uh, excites me uh, to remember the bakers there and a fundamental principle that we are not afraid of ruins. Are we? We can build and rebuild. Buildings come down. The other point I wish to make is Lombard Street. The origins of capitalism in northern Italy. The Italians came here in order to do their banking and to teach the English bankers about it in the Middle Ages. It's global from the beginning, isn't it? And so are we. <laughs> or as Chumbawamba put it, nothing ever burns down by itself. Every fire needs a little bit of help. Give the anarchist a cigarette. You're the anarchist summer. <laughs> I'm a left communist. <laughs> Okay, so we're standing at something called the London Stone. We're standing at something called the London Stone. We're standing at something called the London Stone. This is a fragment. This is a fragment. Of the original piece of limestone. Of the original piece of limestone. Once securely fixed in the ground. Once securely fixed in the ground. Now fronting Cannon Street Station. Now fronting Cannon Street Station. Removed in 1742. Removed in 1742. To the north side of the street. In to the seven, north side of the street. In 1798. 1798. It was built into the south wall. It was built into the south wall. Of the Church of St. Swithin. Of the Church of St. Swithin. Church of St. Swithin London Stone, sorry. The Church of St. Swithin London Stone. Which stood here until demolished in 1962. Which stood here until demolished in 1962. Its origin and purpose are unknown. Not very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but in 1188 there was a reference to Henry. In 11, what is it? 88, yeah. there's a reference to Henry. Son of Eilwyn. Son of Eilwyn. De Londonstone. De Londonstone. <laughs> Subsequently Lord Mayor of London. Subsequently Lord Mayor of London. That's it. That's it. <laughs> so I don't know if uh, anybody here has heard of Jack Kay, but he was one of the people who a stream of people who led a revolt and came to London and um, he did actually with his sword uh, strike the stone with his sword which was uh, he, it was considered to help support his claim for the um, uh, the throne of England and uh, if you're familiar with the story of Excalibur the, the extracting the, the sword from the stone it was related to that kind of mythology that, that you do this kind of sword magic with a stone and you're not king. So uh, he was also claiming uh, descent from Mortimer, that was part of his... Jack Cade! Jack Cade! But, um, perhaps if we really want to change society, we don't have to worry about finding someone who's, who wants to be a new king, but actually, you know... Or a magic I want to be king. We all want to be king. I want to be king. 
<laughs> so, um, anyway, so this is the London Right. <laughs> What about the 140,000 people that died of Fiox because it wasn't tested properly? Go and tell them! We're here today because the New York Stock Exchange is floating the shares of Hunting the Life Sciences. Now the London Stock Exchange refused to do this. That's why Hunting the Life Sciences actually trade their shares in the United States of America. Now this is a company that's been exposed six, seven times with video footage showing animals such as beagles, cats and monkeys being butchered for things like glue, paint, oven cleaner, artificial sweeteners, pesticides, herbicides and oils. And this all happens in Hunting the Life Sciences. They are Europe's biggest animal testing laboratory and they are Europe's, even Europe's a large animal testing laboratory, excuse me. And they kill 180,000 animals every single year. There's not many contract animal testing labs that actually test on monkeys, cats, dogs, and all the other animals as well. Even horses, pigs, and sheep are in hunting the life sciences being tested on. Now this is this laboratory has been exposed on, on film. The person who was actually employed to teach other workers how to treat animals was actually caught on film punching a beagle puppy in the face. who was no more than a couple of months of age. Just because when he tries to take blood samples from this animal, these veins were not developed well enough, so he could so he couldn't easily take blood out of his veins. And he got so angry with this little beagle puppy, you could see him on film, grabbing him by the scruff of the neck, shaking him, terrifying him so much, this puppy was weeping, was yelping, just like a human baby would if it was in the same situation, trying to get away. But beagle, beagle dogs, by their very nature, are not aggressive animals. That's why you never see Rottweilers or pit bull terriers being tested on in laboratories. They only use the weaker animals that are not going to be fighting back and injuring the people that are causing them so much suffering. That's the only reason they use beagles, they're not genetically similar to humans. And we're here today because the New York Stock Exchange is the only exchange on the planet that is still willing to let this company trade their shares. I'm trying to speak up a bit because I know some people at the back can't, can't hear. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of upping the volume a little bit. So I'm getting used to it. Um, I imagine that some of you people here were around in this area back on um, June the 18th. Woo! You certainly were. Right. And you might be aware of what was going on inside this building. Now, I find it really bizarre when I listen on the I don't watch TV. I've given up on TV, but I do listen to the radio. And I turn on this in the radio and there's all these people going, oh, this financial collapse. Nobody said it was going to happen. Nobody knew it was going to happen. When, I don't know how many thousand demonstrators there were here, here on June the 18th, who knew exactly this was what was going, who went in to the futures market up the stairs, right? Yeah. And what did they do? Did they say, oh, thank you for coming and explaining the catastrophe <laughs> that is just around the corner that's going to happen in a few years' time. No, they did not. <laughs> what they did, they said, oh, you can't come in here. Oh, call the police. Oh, do all this, do all that. Right? So they are still lying when they say nobody knew it was going to happen. Thousands of people knew it was going to happen. And Thousands of people took the trouble to come here, took the trouble to go to the Bank of England, took the trouble to go to the Stock Exchange, took the trouble to go throughout the whole of the city of London and explain to anyone who <laughs> listened that this whole system that they had was heading for disaster and they didn't want to listen and the people on the radio still don't want to listen. So... Hey! Anybody else want to say... A, can I just say something? I reckon it's eight generations of Marxists that know about this as well. Yeah. Okay, ever since uh, Lehman Brothers collapsed, uh, what, six weeks ago, I found it very difficult to stop myself laughing. Um, 
And uh, what we did, uh, what it, when was it? Uh, two weeks ago, tonight's full moon, like the last dark moon, Halloween. A lot of us that was, was involved in the carnival day against capitalism, and we decided to do something um, at Canary Wharf. And we were laughing and we were dancing on the grave of capitalism. And what we decided to do, we're not quite sure, but we decided that every dark moon from now on, we're going to do a little bit more to celebrate, to laugh, to dance as capitalism disintegrates. We're going to get a tsunami of redundancies and, and uh, collapses probably around Easter. There will be enormous resistance. We may have just a few months around the world to save the whole of humanity cut at the moment on the tipping point of climate change from complete disaster. But on the other hand, there's lots of us. We're brilliantly organised. We've got the internet. We're, we're doing well at the moment. Let's just celebrate and let's overthrow this system as soon as we possibly can. That's it. Hey. Well, just to say, uh, are we going down to the bottom? All right, well, if, if ever you want to go walk down to the bottom, which is also the other entrance to the London International Futures Exchange, which we went into on June the 18th, and the most extraordinary images were the top of the escalator, which had been completely trashed, with images of traders, because the police took 40 minutes to get here, because uh, there were so many people in the streets, 8,000 people in the streets, that there were traders in their colour jackets fighting off anti-capitalists trying to get up into their, into their, uh, into their... Eerie. Eerie. Earrings. Earring. Eerie. 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 <laughs> but if you go a bit further down, you can see uh, they, 10 days after June the 18th, they actually erected massive medieval barriers in front of that entrance. Big blue barriers to stop it ever happening again. The thing is, it's the 10th anniversary of June the 18th, this June, and I think we should all do something to celebrate because it's even more relevant as Fabian's told us. What a good us. idea! Um, <laughs> and the other... The, yeah, it's it's um, it's it, it's completely virtual now. Uh, a few years after '99, they actually sacked the, all the traders uh, who were doing the trading on the floor, and it's completely virtual now. It's completely, you know. Or in the word of the Sex Pistols, there's no future for you. Um, for me, one of the important things about um, June, June the 18th when I was down here was I was, it was a very busy day and there came a point when I needed to sit down and rest a little bit and I came to this little bit part. <laughs> and I, I came to this little park and I was having a little, uh, I, I just thought I'd sit down for a little while and everything like that. When just in front of me, um, something quite strange happened and there was this woman who was um, banging this man's head against the floor. And it became apparent that um, he'd done something really bad to her. And somehow on that day he gave an occasion for her to explain to him in a very clear way that he should never do whatever he did to her ever again to anyone and for me that kind of struck a, a note that it's not just a matter of uh, seeing all the problems in, in, in the world uh, as being to do with various people in all these big buildings around us but to actually to look at our own selves and how we treat each other uh, and uh, everything like that and how that's, is, you know, what we're talking about when we're changing the world is as much about uh, changing ourselves and changing each other as dealing with all these um, big institutions which we have to challenge and one of the institutions I'd like to challenge is the person with the microphone speaking all the time yeah. and it's just been one person so what I really want to do is I want to invite people to come up and if they've got any other like uh, you know, uh, things they'd like to share, whether it's about uh, J18 or about anything else, to kind of um, really make it a little bit more involving people. This, uh, this meeting on the 15th in Washington will primarily be about the Doha deal, shoving through the Doha deal, the trade deal. Is it? Yeah.
Hello? Yeah? That's good. Okay. And then point the horn about horizontal. Right. Sorry. Thank you. Right. I don't know they're good for something. Um, Right, the, the meeting this week in, in uh, Washington will be, pri on the 15th, will primarily be about trying to shove through very quickly the Doha deal, the trade deal, uh, to tie things up before people start realising that they want things to go back a bit more social. Um, so I ran into um, Mark Thompson that runs the BBC a couple of nights ago and so said that the BBC has never reported properly about international trade, uh, which they haven't. And um, he asked me for information about it and I sent it to him and he's distributed it. But speak up about the Doha stuff. Don't let them just keep parroting that um, we don't want protectionism and that's it and that's good for us. Speak up against it because it ties people into a framework, a legal framework, where we can't re-socialise things. So um, that, watch this weekend and speak up about it. Thanks. I'll do it again if you don't care. <laughs> <laughs> nice little bit of uh, uh, underground history is that um, you can see we're actually on the edge of a valley here. You can see the, the, the hill slightly goes down and at the bottom of that hill, like just on the corner of that building there, uh, is the River Walbrook which uh, is one of the 75 rivers and streams that runs under London that are all buried, were buried to create the sewage system in the 19th century. Um, the River Walbrook was actually London's first river. river. London was built not on the Thames, but on the Walbrook. Uh, in fact, where all these finance buildings are now were actually Roman temples, uh, many of them to, um, oh God, who's the God who, uh, Mithras, there we go, many of them to Mithras. Um, and the Warbrook uh, was buried about 400 years before the other rivers were buried. But uh, during J18, uh, we actually symbolically re brought the Warbrook back to life by uh, opening up a water hydrant on the corner there. So it's on a hot summer's day and there was water shooting up probably higher than this tree and people taking all their clothes off, making love and, <laughs> and dancing in the water and singing. and and it was a beautiful day. But then the water also happened to actually flood the uh, basement of the London's Future Exchange for us. So they had to close that bit down. There was also 10 million pounds worth of damage done to the city on that day, not simply by water, but by, by, by imagination and will. Hello everyone, I'm a PCS member that was supposed to be on strike on Monday, but the, uh, our National Executive Council called it off. But I won't go into that, I think we've got to go wherever workers are going on strike, because we've got to say that it's not, it's not, the, rich, it's not the poor that should have to pay for this uh, crisis, it's, it, it's the rich. Um, they should be taxed more, they, you know, wherever there's picket lines, we should be there to support anyone who fights back. In Southampton, they went on an unofficial strike because they wanted to go on a four-day week and the workers there didn't accept it. It didn't happen at JCB where they accepted wage cuts and cuts in. But where are people fighting back? If people are going to have their houses repossessed, I think all of us here, and, and there are thousands of people, millions of people who want to fight back, should be out there defending people. They did it, the, Com the Communist Party did it in the 1930s. I think we can replicate that. We can stop this crisis. We can do it, make sure that it's ordinary people that win and not that not lose out. Uh, just one idea on that is um, we've had very fantastic street parties which kind of stopped about 10 years ago, but one idea that's come, come alive again now is, is a lot more decentralized local street parties. As soon as you have a street party, because everybody in the street gets to know each other. And if we get to know exactly who might be threatened with eviction, we can use the street parties to get to know each other and closely monitor anyone under threat and just simply make the whole street complete no-go area that no bailiff would want to go anywhere near. And we can do that right up and down the country, I think. Um, one of the things that might get that started is to have, um, and I'm, I, because I'm so interested in how hunter-gatherers organize, hunter-gatherers respect the moon and every dark moon um, hunter-gatherers need to make sure there's no light pollution, need to be able to connect with the ancestors, to see the stars, to know there's a Milky Way up there. And if we just start every time there is a dark moon, when astronomers and maybe little kids with optical telescopes might want to look up at the stars, switch off the lights. That could then be a kind of way of 
showing that we can at least do something collectively. It's not that difficult. You go to the wall, you switch the switch off, you do it collectively. You can see collectively that we can have a response that we ourselves collectively can not only um, be consumers of this whole system, but we can also switch it off when we feel like it. And in doing that, we can start to make, make the conditions under which um, nobody will get evicted because we'll be alert to every person who might possibly be evicted. Street parties, not centralised, but localised. Well, insurrection is a very good idea. Let's build towards it. <laughs> right, is there anybody, anybody else got something to say at this point? Okay, maybe you want to say something a bit later on. We're going to continue along down the road here. of London works and um, how it functions and the livery companies are an important part of it but uh, another part of it is they have the these are the parish churches and and it's the city of London is organized in Paris in um, parishes and they have aldermen and they also have uh, what they call common councilmen and um, one of the things we were we were talking in the Tipperary pub last night where uh, Peter's book was being launched was, uh, was about the, the role of commons and that, that we, you know, as Peter eloquently put it, you know, yes, you know, it's all of us. But however, there are, in the ways that, that, that governments organise, sometimes they just say, well, actually, we'll just get a few people together and we'll share it out amongst ourselves. Um, Peter, would you like to... <laughs> about common, yeah, common. Common space Yeah, growing up, uh, I was a common back then in the old days when they had the governors, the Toshes, and the aristocrats. But as an American, you were automatically common. So I was very glad about that. It's taken me years to try to understand what is the commons. And they say the common council. But you go into the churches and you pay different money you know, for how close you can be to the pulpit. You pay money for what kind of uh, pillows you can sit on. Do you follow me? In other words, the Lord's mansions here were class ridden. Remember how we began back there with the Lord, the, uh, the earth belongs to the Lord in the fullness thereof. We know now from our global movement that it belongs to, to us. We are the commons that they're talking. When Jared Winstanley well, I mentioned that, said the earth is a common treasury for all. These churches helped prevent that. The capitalists have their commons. Do you follow? We were at Lombard Street, the Italians, the Jews, the Russians. Every, there are capitalists and traders all over who forget their nationality for their trading. The, the crisis, the financial crisis, we know they are trying to sort out amongst themselves. And money is the way they try to calculate it. Credit and debt is a relationship of trust within the ruling class. When that trust fails, it falls apart and money ceases to be that token of equality by which the ruling class organizes its commons. Now, how are we going to organize our commons? This is, this is what we're thinking about. And here in the city of London, this thought occurred earlier in 1780. And I think Mark asked me to just say one quick word about insurrection in 1780 that was heard around the world and surely bodes important, uh, it's important for the Bank of England because then an alliance of commoners throughout London, led by African Americans, Ben Bousey, for example, came into the city of London and attempted to enter the bank 
and to find the gold in the bank. This was the Gordon riots. And as a result, terror befell the common people of London. 500 were killed in street battles. The Bank of England was protected by John Wilkes and it developed its own police force, a, a yeomanry. They, they were barracked in Westminster and every evening they'd march back and forth ever afterwards. And the bank still has this, uh, you know, that they might have lovely uniforms and a banquet every year, but they are still on guard. The other thing at the, ba at the Gordon riots of 1780, besides the 500 killed in the insurrection, besides the permanent armed forces around the bank, the other thing was the hangings. They were not just at Tyburn. They wished to disperse the hangings. Chris asked us, neighborhood by neighborhood, to have block parties. The ruling class in 1780, neighborhood by neighborhood, had hangings. We must answer them, and Chris is helping us to figure out how. Uh, the symbolism of the defense, uh, the uh, complicity of the Christians in their defense of property is right behind us on these fences. This fence, this, yeah, this railing is topped by spears. Um, that's not an accident, they're meant to be there and you will find very often that property is defended by a defensible steel boundary like this topped with symbolic spears. Is there anybody? Hey, look, Fabian, 1682, <laughs> financial capitalism and it's a clock <laughs> ticking away the minutes of our lives that they hope to appropriate. It's the wrong Anybody? kind of clock. No clock but the sun and the moon. <laughs> oh, nice. oh. <laughs> right, well, one of the things walking up here is that actually there's lots of uh, really nice little places dotted around the city of London and there's also lots of little alleys and ways you can get through which aren't on the main road and you can get away from the traffic and to me living in a city could, could be to me living in a city could be a much more pleasurable experience if it wasn't dominated by capitalism if the buildings that we see around us weren't built just you, you just need to look at them all there and they're just it's all geared around work really and um, it's kind of more uh, more is given over to the motor car than to the human being and moving around so um, it's like a, at the moment it's a bit of a challenge to, to find the kind of really pleasant ways of moving through a, through a, a city but um, one of the things in, when we we are setting about changing this world one of the things that I feel has to be pretty high up on agenda is how to make the cities that we live in more pleasurable places for, for everyone who, who has the opportunity to visit them. Reclaim the streets, kill the car! <laughs> Any walk around London, to my mind, wouldn't be really complete unless you come down by the river. Because really, the river is, is key to understanding why London exists in the first place. And what happened was that, that London was the... Um, the lowest place that you could cross from from the north of England, particularly going down towards Dover, and so it became right from the beginning a big port. So it developed as a port, and the river was there to develop it as a port. 
and for a certain period of time London was actually the largest port in the world and um, you know we've seen about how the imperial ambitions of uh, of London developers all, all based on being a maritime trading empire that was how it was built up and uh, so the river and the people who worked on the river and uh, the seamen who sailed out across from the river and, and went across the world they were an intrinsic part of it and uh, they always paid a... a <laughs> they always played a very alarming part <laughs> in the role of class struggle. Um, the word strike comes from the sailors when they took the sails down and refused to sail. Um, and also, the, we must also remember the seamen were one of the major ways in which information got spread by the working class internationally. The seamen would be going from port to port to port and they would be giving first-hand accounts of uh, what happened in the various places they, they visited. Um, you know, when there was a revolt, it was often the seamen who became the people who would tell in the taverns to anybody who, who, who cared to listen exactly what, what had been happening. So the river is kind of always a strong part of uh, really understanding what London's about. Okay, we're going to move along this way a little bit now. Just oh. Is that working? No. I don't know, you'll remember when Tony Blair used to say that they were building a classless society in this country. Oh, yeah. the, the, the bridge here is a great metaphor because when they opened this bridge, it was the... Um, the Wobbly Bridge. Yeah. Yes. When they opened this bridge, it connected what was one of the poorest boroughs in Britain with the richest square mile in the country. But of course the bridge didn't work. So it was a fantastic metaphor, I think, for, Br for Blair's Britain. All we can say is they fixed the bridge, they haven't fixed the society. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I say something very briefly? Um, sorry. I know it's a cliche, but the Tate Gallery is over the other side of the river, and the Tate Gallery is built on slavery. Tate. Sugar slavery. Anybody else? I'd just like to add a little information about the series of Dark Moon events that is known as Dancing on the Grave of Capitalism. One of the Dark Moons between now and June the 18th anniversary happens to be just, it happens to be Mardi Gras, or at that Mardi Gras, Shrove Tuesday, Carnival Shrove Tuesday is the day before the Dark Moon. So we are scheduling an event, uh, a carnival. Um, in the spirit of New Orleans with a zombie voodoo walk. Probable target is Oxford Street or some similar consumerist plastic packaged paradise. And we will go with masked Sambistas and Keystone Cops for security. Um, so please get working on your zombie outfits. That is February 24th. <laughs> So we just walked a little, little bit further now. Someone just mentioned to me that um, the bridge we just saw before we turned away from the river was the Black Fires Bridge, which uh, some of you will know is all linked with the uh, death of the banker Roberto Calvi, whose, um, whose body was find, found hanging from it. Uh, and it was a, a scandal linked up with the, um, the Catholic churches uh, using various Masonic connections to move its banking this way and that way and all linked to the mafia and all sorts of connections you'd imagine that uh, capitalists get involved in. And uh, here we got another example of a little kind of totem pole, which I think is meant to represent the seven ages of man. And uh, again, you, you, there's these little places as you walk through, which are kind of, I don't know, I find this place a bit, a bit weird, really. We, <laughs> you know, we, you know, this kind of pattern area where you can walk in and then there's some bits higher. And there's another kind of brick pattern over there. There's that bit of sculpture there, but you know, in the end, I think you could do with a few plants, you know, if they've they got a nice bit of garden going on here, it'd be a really nice place, so there's a whole load of things which can be done, 
a lot of potential here. I don't know about the building all around. It looks a bit like a, I don't know, a prison, I suppose. But you know, but we can start somewhere. Loads of window boxes, is it? Somebody else want to speak? <laughs> so I'd just like to point out, um, behind you is uh, an inverse pyramid, coincidentally, which is curious because um, the kind of I was at a talk uh, last Friday um, by Werner Bernfeld, and he talks about inverse pyramids of debt. He literally described the kind of current corporate structure and many companies as, a, as, as basically a pyramid with a very tiny amount of production at its base and then a huge pyramid, wobbly pyramid of paper claims on value rising above it. So I think it's worth thinking about that metaphor, especially since it's actually embodied in the architecture of the city itself. So, what were you saying over there? Okay, we've got the Church of Scientology there in case any of us want to get in touch with our feet and beings or wandering two ten yards behind the back of our skull. So, um, hey, Anthony, Anthony, can you give me a hand? Thank you. <laughs> So I know you don't need yeah, to spend your uh, money on it. Chris Knight just, le just left. He had to go to work, sadly. I feel like we should have a moment of silence. <laughs> In any case, he, was, he shared with me some of the incidents of, what was it, June 18th, 1999? Yep. What a great time that was. I'm so happy to learn. But uh, among the incidents he shared was his daughter worked in one of the financial houses and she came and joined the demonstration and it reminded me of two things is that first you know back to 9-11 in the United States which is which was the seemed to be the ign igniter of the war of terrorism was really an attack upon our working class in New York you know, next to London, one of the most international ones on the planet. Yeah, that was one thing I wanted to mention. But the other thing was, these buildings and these institutions can collapse as swiftly as the Stasi collapsed in East Germany. Do you follow? They're rotten to the core because inside of them are the workers like us with the same longings and the same yearnings. That was all. <laughs> yeah. events of contestation in London was the Peasants' Revolt. Oh, right. And um, <laughs> the, the, the king was actually in London and he, he, he was a little bit worried about what was going on. Uh, the peasants were kind of um, not putting up with the raw deal they were getting. And uh, so he decided to go and hide in the wardrobe, right? And um, so I'm putting I was wondering, well, where is this wardrobe that you went to go and hide it? <laughs> so, um, there is actually a sign here to, to help us. <laughs> so I think the king was quite lucky that sign up wasn't up at the time. <laughs> 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 Let's go and have a look at this wardrobe. <laughs>
the King Paul Road, um, destroyed in the Great Fire, like a, like a lot of London. Um, as Peter said, you know, we, we, we know how to handle destruction. We know how to rebuild again. We know that all the buildings that we see are built, not by financiers putting up their money in various buildings, but actually by people like you and me applying their skills, uh, applying their sweat to actually create. And that's how, how all the stuff around us, that's how it's all created by basically the working class. We, we create everything and we need to find a way in which it can be shared amongst everybody. Um, and, you know, so that this is kind of a, a, a symbol of where the king came to hide in the wardrobe. So, um, on this point I'm going to end, but I'm, I'm going to hand over to Peter. Now he's got a few words to say as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I just like, uh, there's a couple of things I'd like to say. And the first one is, I've been thinking of Watt Tyler uh, quite a bit. And I came to, to read that he had proposed, the peasants had proposed in their great alliance in Bethnal Green and their meetings in Mile End, and then their the destruction of the Lincoln's Inn, their opening of the prisons, and their shooing the king into his closet that they came to understand that they needed also a, a rule and a charter which the king agreed to. And it was to ro roll back the privatization of the time. It was to repair <coughs> what he had stolen. This was in the charter that Watt Tyler proposed to, to Richard, hiding in his wardrobe. And Richard agreed to restore the commons to the peasants and to the people of England. No sooner had he done this than Walbrook, the Lord Mayor, the money man, whose money came from the Southwark stews, the brothels on the other side of the river that brought in the sex workers from Holland to service the, sex, the sexual needs or the sexual dominations of merchant capital in the city of London. Walbrook took that dagger, didn't he, while Watt Tyler was talking to the king and put it in Watt Tyler's heart, stabbed him to death. This was the betrayal at the beginning of royal capitalist alliance at the time of the Peasants' Revolt. <laughs> there is no plaque for Watt Tyler at Smithfield where this betrayal took place. And perhaps it'll be on our agenda in the coming years uh, to put one. So this was the first thing I wish to say. And the second thing I wish I'd like to say is to thank Fabian for his very thoughtful, wonderful tour uh, through the alleys and the courts of this city. So our feet might take it back again. Thank you, Fabian. Thank you. So it's five o'clock, and <laughs> I'd like to thank you. Well, <laughs> All well. I'd like, I think we're probably a little bit thirsty, so I'll tell you in a second where the pub that we're going to is. I'd like to thank Fabian for a fantastic tour, and I'd also like to thank Peter for crossing the Atlantic to be with us. And it's been very a great sort of, you know, four days of you being in town, and a great day today. And thanks everybody for coming along on the walking tour. <laughs>